Hi, I'm Jonathan Lind and this is the first part of a two-part lecture on meta-analysis. The aim here is to give you a brief introduction to meta-analysis and give you information useful when interpreting meta-analysis, not to give you exact information on how to perform them yourself. Meta-analysis literally means an analysis of analysis. So it's when you take data from multiple studies and pool them together to get an overall estimate of the effect of whatever you're analyzing. For example, a therapy within the field of medicine where I'm working. The great advantage of meta-analysis meta -analysis is that it gives you an increased statistical power compared to the individual studies included in the, in the meta-analysis. And in other words, you get better precision. You get a more precise estimate of the overall effect of the treatment. Another great advantage is that the meta-analysis gives you a tool to detect publication bias. And I'll get back to that. Meta-analysis in, uh, in a way has been used since the 17th century when astronomers pooled data from different countries and uh, collected over time to get a better understanding of what was going on in the sky. But the first meta-analysis within the field of medicine where I'm working was this uh, report in the British Medical Journal from 1904. It was published by uh, Carl Pearson, who was a statistician who um, also invented the correlation, the Pearson correlation, and also the chi-square test. And in this particular publication, he looked at treatment of um, enteric fevers using uh, some sort of inoculation. And he, he pulled um, data sets from different parts of the British Empire, from India and uh, from different parts of Africa. And you probably can't talk about meta-analysis without mentioning the Cochrane collaboration. Although it's not synonymous with the meta-analysis, it has a lot to do with it. It was uh, established in 1993 and uh, Cochrane himself, Archie Cochrane, was not involved in the establishment of the Cochrane collaboration because he was already dead by, by then, but it was named after him. He was uh, Scottish physician and a very enthusiastic proposer of uh, evidence-based medicine and the use of randomized controlled trials and systematic reviews and meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials to improve the outcome in medical treatments of different kinds. And today the Cochrane Collaboration engages more than 37,000 volunteers in 130 countries, so it's a non-profit organization and these are not paid co-workers, but they they work for free performing these uh, systematic reviews published regularly. And uh, it's usually systematic reviews of randomized clinical trials looking at uh, mainly the therapeutic effect of different sorts of therapies. You shouldn't perform a meta-analysis without a systematic liter literature review, because if you were to cherry-pick the studies you liked, those that gave the results you wanted, then of course the results of the meta-analysis would also indicate what you wanted. But uh, what you're aiming for here is actually the truth. And um, to get that, you would have to include all studies available on the topic that you're going to meta-analyze. Systematic review, on the other hand, does not have to involve a meta-analysis. Because when performing the systematic review, you might find that the study designs or patient populations differ so widely between studies that it's not feasible to pool them in meta-analysis, but you may still present them as 
a systematic review. And when performing a systematic review, you first of all have to define what sources you are going to use to find the literature that uh, will go into the meta-analysis. It could be literature databases such as PubMed or Embase, uh, different study registra registries such as the uh, clinicaltrials.gov. You can look into reference lists in uh, review articles or original articles, read Congress abstracts, contact experts in the field to uh, get hold of additional data, for example. You also need a search strategy defining what search terms and words you are going to use to find the uh, literature you're looking for. And there should be clearly defined inclusion and exclusion criteria defining what publications may and which may not be included in the meta-analysis. Then data should be extracted and it should be defined how this data extraction will be performed, for example, by whom, by one person, two persons, what will be extracted, how will it be encoded, will, for example, age be encoded as a continuous variable or as elderly versus children. If you find when uh, extracting data that there probably is useful information, but it's not available in the publication itself. You may or you may not contact the authors and ask for additional information. And preferably, of course, you should ask them. Usually there is also a systematic and structure assessment of study quality for each included study or the risk of bias associated with that particular study. And then, of course, it has to be determined what outcome the meta-analysis is going to look at and what meta-analysis method is to be used. This is an example of the meta-analysis we performed where we looked at the influence of a specific gene, the CYP2C9 gene, on the dose requirements of warfarin, an anticoagulant drug. And uh, to find relevant studies, we looked into PubMed, Medline, and used warfarin as a search term, and then combined it with a lot of mesh terms, as they called, uh, for cytochrome, P450 enzymes, and genetic stuff, and a lot of text words for the same thing, including polymorphisms and genetic alleles. And such. And we also looked into another database, Embase. And when choosing this search strategy, you should aim for sensitivity rather than specificity. That is, you will not want to miss any useful studies. And in order to get everything that is useful, you will probably have to look at quite a lot of not so useful publications. So in this case we captured uh, almost 1200 studies in the primary search, which is a rather reasonable number I would say. We went through the abstracts of these publications and found that 970 could be excluded due to irrelevant or lacking data. And we then read 201 articles in full text. 90 of these could be excluded because they didn't meet the inclusion criteria and uh, then 46 could uh, be excluded after data extraction because they turned out to be uh, double publications where the same results are published more than once. We also found that in 46 studies there was relevant data, but it was not presented in a useful way in the publication. So we contacted the authors and in the end we did get information, additional information from authors of 20 studies, enabling us to include them in the meta-analysis. And in the end, 39 studies were included in the final analysis. And this kind of flowchart 
you usually see in both systematic reviews and meta-analysis. Then it's time to perform the actual meta-analysis. The first thing you have to remember is that meta-analysis needs to address a narrow and very specific question that can get a numeric answer. So you can't just look at the pros and cons of some sort of therapy, but you have to, as in this example, ask for something very specific. In this case, we ask how many percent does a particular cyp 2 genotype reduce the orphan dose requirements compared to the wild type genotype? And the actual meta-analysis then, it's basically a mean of the result from all individual studies, but it can't just be an arithmetic mean because then a very small study with the low precision would be given the same weight as a large study where you probably have more information on the correct value. So you have to weigh them in some way. And usually the studies are weighed weighted according to the inverse standard error, that is the precision, so that the study with a better precision gets a higher weight in the, in the um, analysis. It's also possible to use the study size, the number of included patients, to uh, get the weight, or not so often you can use some measurement of the study quality as a, as a weight. And, um, the results are usually presented in a forest plot such as this. In this case, we have looked at the CYP209, STAR2, STAR3 genotype and compared it to the STAR1, STAR1 genotype. And each blob here represents a single study. And the size of the square indicates the size of the study, the number of patients included. And the lines here, that's the 95% confidence interval of the dose requirements in percent. So you can see, for example, that this small study here has a very wide confidence interval. They didn't find a significant difference between the two genotypes because the confidence interval crosses zero here, so no difference. While this large study, for example, has a very narrow confidence interval. And down here you have the overall meta-analysis result. In this case, we found a 57% dose reduction in individuals carrying the STAR2, STAR3 genotype. And the confidence interval ranged from 49 to 64%. Ideally, the meta-analysis should include, of course, a large number of small studies that are performed in exactly the same way, including exactly the same kind of patients, giving the same therapy, measuring the outcome in the same way. But each of the, these studies would be too small to give conclusive results. And then when you pooled it, you artificially get a huge study and you get the answer you're looking for. But in reality, of course, no two studies are exactly the same. And uh, often, when meta-analysis is performed, different outcomes are actually pooled after some sort of standardization. For example, if you're looking at depression, different studies may have used different depression scales, and then you can pool them together anyway in the yeah, meta-analysis. It's also possible to pool continuous outcomes with binary outcomes expressed as, for example, odds ratios, relative risks, or acid ratios after mathematical transformation. It's also common that different patient populations are pooled in meta-analysis. For example, depressions of different severity may have been pooled together, patients with the different severity of the depression. It may also be that different treatments have been pulled together. For example, if you're looking at the overall effect of selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs, you may have pulled studies in different SSRIs together to get an overall result for the entire group of drugs. And this is a potential problem when you try to interpret the results 
because you do get a mathematically precise estimate of the overall effect. But what does it mean when you have pulled different outcomes, different treatments, and perhaps different patient populations? When uh, looking at the uh, statistical models used in meta-analysis, they can roughly be divided, divided into fixed effect and random effects models. And the fixed effect model, it assumes that there is really only one patient population from which all the study samples are drawn. And um, you can look something like this. You have a patient population. The underlying patient population and then you perform two studies and you get diverging results and in the fixed effect model it's assumed that this is only because of sampling error because your samples are not infinitely large and then you get a random error and you end up with somewhat different um, estimates of the real overall effect which is this one in the random effects model you assume, on the other hand, that there is actually an infinite number of patient populations as well. You do have an overall global mean. Then you have patient populations normally distributed around this mean. So when you get this result in a particular study, it's because it's drawn from patient population that lies this far away from the global mean, and then you have a sampling error. And you get this result in another study, and that's because that population lies a bit to the right here, and then you have a sampling error. And the random effects models, they give wider confidence intervals. So they admit that you are less certain about the effect estimates that you get out of the uh, meta-analysis. The fact that study results, the results from individual studies, differ more than can be explained from the sampling error, that's called heterogeneity. And there are measures of the heterogeneity, and they are usually presented next to the overall meta-analysis result. And the most commonly used are the Cochrane's Q and the I2. Cochrane's Q, that's not Cochrane, that's another person, Cochrane. And it's a significant test where the zero hypothesis is that there is no hydrogenity among studies. And when you get significant results on the Cochrane Q test, that means you have a significant heterogeneity. But it does have a rather low statistical power, so you may end up with non-statistical, non-significant results, although there is heterogeneity. The I2 value indicates the proportion of variability or variance that is due to heterogeneity among studies rather than only sampling error and it can uh, range from zero which is no heterogeneity to 100 percent 